in this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore an HP 9845B vintage computer. As you can see I've moved on to the tape drives. There are two of these in this particular machine. Uh, one is uh, relatively standard, it's an option but uh, most have it fitted and the second drive is an option and this does have both drives fitted. Uh, you can see that uh, they are in need of some attention, uh, extremely dirty and um, it's not terrible, it's not uh, the worst I've seen. The covers as well are sticking, so these need uh, cleaning. So um, the way these work is the two flaps uh, work in opposition. You push the bottom one down with a tape cartridge and it should pop down and it's very stiff, so that will need uh, cleaning. The eject button, it's just a lever and a plastic button, the two uh, levers uh, are used to push the tape back out once it's been pushed into the tape drive. The control board, it's quite a complex control system on this. Uh, it includes uh, pre-compensation for the uh, tape uh, data. I'll explain pre-compensation in the next video in case you're not familiar with that. Uh, in this particular video we're just going to look at the hardware and um, as I say there are two of these. This is one of these boards for each of the two tape drives. Underneath the uh, large heatsink is a another custom um, HP hybrid module. Quite a complex system on this, and um, almost all of the electronics is housed, or at least all the control electronics is housed in that particular uh, hybrid device. So hopefully, uh, at least one of them works. These are very standardised drives uh, for this period of this machine you find these types of drives in all sorts of different HP machines. They're very common and uh, also very common is the failure modes for these. Now firstly you can see it's desperately in need of some cleaning. I don't think it's had all that much use judging by the wear or lack of wear on the read write head. Um, but as ever uh, and as is typical with these drives the rubber tyre has completely disintegrated from the drive capstan. The rest just needs a really good clean. The control uh, board, the interface board, is on the rear of these drives. So a very nice uh, kind of self-contained unit. Fairly easy to get apart. Um, what we need to do is to remove the, um, the the capstan so that we can effectively replace this part of it. I've been over these repairs before. I'll show you one of these that I've done in a minute. Um, to get these apart all we have to do is take out the three screws that hold the PCB to the back. We can then remove the four screws that go through the rubber grommets that hold the main uh, drive assembly to the bracket and then we can separate the two parts. Give it a good clean. We can then take out the four screws that hold the motor in place. We can take out the two grub screws that hold uh, this uh, capstan in place and then we can withdraw this. And I have made the replacement drive wheel for this. It needs machining to final uh, diameter, but I don't do that until I've fitted it and there's some machining required for that, which as I said. I have done the second drive already. I haven't videoed it, but uh, this is what they look like once they've been done. I don't think this drive's had um, hardly any use at all. The motor's still fairly tight. It wouldn't turn at all when I started. And um, I did free it up, lubricate the bearings, but it's still fairly tight. And I think that's just because it hasn't been used very much. But you can see I have replaced the drive wheel on that uh, particular drive. And I've modified it as well. I've raised the height. So not only will this drive now accept the original low profile tapes, but it will also now take the Tor DC2000 tapes. So this kind of future proofs it. It means that we can use uh, either of the two tapes. I do have some um, original HP tapes that have data on them, but I will need to replace the drive belts in those before we try using them and then hopefully we can transfer the data onto one of the newer tapes or a number of the newer tapes. So as you can see these do come up very nice and clean and um, I just need to do the same 
exercise on the second drive. The PCBs are fairly easy to initially deal with. I use, do the usual uh, basic static testing, just multimeter across all the caps and across the power rails, make sure there's nothing untoward there. I've removed the um, gaskets, you have these gold zebra strips as we've seen on the rest of the machine. So I've taken that off, given that a clean. And of course I've taken the processor off so I can clean the contacts on that. Again, be extremely careful, these are very easy to destroy. And um, this just bolts in place, it will only go on one way around, uh, one of the holes is offset so you can't fit it one way. And um, it's just really making sure that all the contacts are clear. Uh, you can take this hybrid off the heatsink, there's nothing really, it's not bonded on there, it's just heatsink compound, but uh, uh, I'm going to wait until I'm ready to refit this before I do that. Take it off, a bit of um, IPA to clean off the old compound, fit some new, and uh, then we can refit it to the board. So hopefully at least one of these, if not both of them, work. And be very careful with these, if you damage them, um, you'll have a major problem trying to get this up and running. I've also cleaned and polished up the, uh, the, the door assembly on this. So this one now is nice and free. The other one was very sticky, but this now uh, moves nice and freely. And hopefully you can see I've polished these scratches out of the door. So that's come up very nice and clean. I've also cleaned the eject assembly so that's uh, again come up nice and clean as well so this particular drive is now ready to refit this is the left hand uh, additional drive on this machine so what we'll do now is the same work on the primary drive that I've done on the secondary get this uh, stripped down get it cleaned machine and uh, modify the capstan and drive wheel so it will accept both tapes and also be usable. If you try putting a tape into this uh, drive with the drive wheel in this condition you would just destroy the tape so it's uh, best not to do that. And one nice thing with these particular drives is the read write head is actually plugged in. Quite often they're just soldered on but this has got a, a nice little plug on the back, usually fairly tight you can unplug this and you do need to unplug it to get to one of the screws that hold the motor in place. It's best to do that rather than remove the read right head because otherwise you'd have to realign the read right head which can be a bit of a pain to do. So uh, without further ado we'll get the bench cleared and then we'll start dismantling this unit and uh, see what we find once we get it apart. The first thing we need to do is to take the three screws out that hold the PCB to the bracket. So we'll take those screws out. Okay, so this PCB is now loose. We'll just get this out of the way. So a good method to uh, hold small screws and uh, bolts uh, is uh, just a short uh, piece of silicon tubing. Uh, this screws into the particular screw screws into the uh, case of the HP so there is no nut for it but this will just stop it um, getting lost and it saves me having to remember which screw goes where. Okay now we've got that out the, the only thing holding the tape mechanism into the bracket are four screws. Two here and there's two underneath the PCB. So I'll get those removed. Now I am supporting the drive underneath here. I don't want it kind of levering back and possibly cracking the plastic. So make sure it's supported as you take the screws out. The other thing I'm doing is quite often these screws have been over tightened a little bit and if you just try uh, unscrewing them anti-clockwise it can take the thread out of the plastic so sometimes if you just move them back and forward a little bit it'll just loosen it up and it'll avoid taking a big piece of the plastic moulding away with these screws so if you take the screws out and there's a lot of plastic on the end 
um, then for the next screws just work them back and forth a little bit. Okay, that's now loose. It does take a bit of persuasion to get this out of here. It's loose, but um, you've got to kind of uh, wiggle this out. Now, you will need to cut this cable tie because we will be taking this motor out and we don't want to have to disconnect all the wires. So we'll just cut through the cable tie. Get that out of the way. And now I'll just work this out. So what you have to do is try and squeeze all the wires through, turn the board sideways, and then this should, in theory, lift out. Like I said, it is a bit of a, a wriggle, but uh, OK, we've got that out. And I'll also remove these spacers. OK, and then we can give this a clean. The next thing we have to do is get the motor out. So we need to get this um, drive capstan out. So to get to it, we have to remove the motor. It's held onto the motor shaft with a couple of grub screws. But unfortunately, there's no way to get to them. In fact, the only tricky bit in getting this off is one of the screws is down here. You probably can't see it, but it's kind of underneath this connector. But this is plugged on on this particular uh, drive, so we can actually unplug this if we're careful. And so that exposes the screw. Once we start taking these screws out, we need to be careful. The encoder disc is right underneath the plastic, and if you let the motor move around too much, you can damage that disc. The disc in the other drive is actually in quite poor condition. Not really sure if it's going to work. We'll have to give it a go. Um, but it's, it's not physically damaged. It's just there was a lot of dirt and debris, and it looks like, again, moisture got in there. There are signs that moisture has been in here as well. That's why it kind of gets these little dots. It's a sign that it's been wet. Uh, okay, so next thing is to remove the four screws. There's one underneath the switches. You can't get that screw all the way out, but it is now loose. Remove the other three. We can get those out. And again, I'm holding the motor in. I don't want it coming out just yet. I want to make sure we try and lift it directly out and not uh, have it slide sideways. It is in a sort of recess so it can't move. If you hold it in place it can't slide around and that's what you want to do to avoid uh, possibly damaging the encoder disc. So that's the screws out. The motor should now be free. It's only now held in place with the wires. So if we carefully pull back on it, pull it straight out and make sure we don't uh, hit the encoder on anything on the way out. Okay. So this is what we have to remove. There are two set screws, so we'll just loosen those off. As ever, over tightened. Very careful here to avoid touching the encoder disc. Okay, so this is now loose. Now, sometimes these will just lift off, but the other drive, this was extremely tight. You can use a small pinion puller. What I found works really well is a pair of these, if you're not familiar with these. These are ball joint pliers. They're normally used for um, separating or joining small ball joints on things like model helicopters and the like. I've just modified these slightly, but and what they are is there's a, a cutout in one side and a little peg on the other side. And what you can do is slot these under here, put the peg onto the end of the shaft, and then when you squeeze it, you can see it lifts it up. And although that was actually quite tight, it has now loosened it off. Still too tight to pull all the way off, but you can now put something like a small screw in the end of here. This is too long, but something like this press down again and you can use these to get this off fairly easily. So I'll get it the rest of the way off. Okay, so that now should be far enough up to come off there, which it has. That disc is a bit dark, but um, 
That's just dirty. It actually looks to be in much better condition than the other one. Put to one side for a moment. So the next thing I need to do is get this cleaned. It's, as you can see, filthy. And uh, I'll take this away, give it a really good clean. Do a static test on the interface board. Just your usual multimeter. Make sure there are no shorts or anything obvious. Make sure it all moves freely. If anything's bound up, I'll free it off. This motor spins quite freely, but I will lubricate the bearings. The other one is uh, the other motor is quite tight on the other drive, but this one's uh, much freer. Okay, but the next thing we'll do is modify the capstan. So we can't separate the encoder discs, so we need to be very careful with that. But the next thing to do is get this machined. I have already made up some spare wheels. I keep these spare. I do quite a few of these drives. And with the um, replacement wheel, what we're going to do is machine this end section off the original. You can see where the, uh, the wheels, the rubber tyre is missing. We'll machine this down just at the end so that it's the same diameter as the hole in our replacement wheel and then this will be pressed on be kind of tight press fit and then we'll machine the um, the drive uh, tire the rubber part to the final dimensions so with these i use two different materials i'll either use brass as i've done here um, or i'll use aluminium so uh, this is a, an example of each and the brass tends to be easier to work with, it gives you quite a nice uh, finish um, but the aluminium is more forgiving if you're slightly off centre. The problem with the brass is it is quite heavy and the motor does spin quite fast and if it's even very slightly off centre um, it will make quite a lot of noise and vibrate. Um, if you're not absolutely certain you can get it properly centred, um, use aluminium. It's not because the outer uh, diameter will be uh, non-concentric, it will be spinning correctly because uh, it's machined after it's been assembled. So it is turning centrally, but the, uh, if this isn't perfectly centered, it will be moving slightly off center. So the center of mass will be incorrect. If you're interested, the dimensions for this it's 6.5 across, that's how tall it is, it's obviously taller than the original. The original is like 3.9 or something like that, 3.94, 3.9 millimetres, but we go taller to um, cater for the other type of tape. So it's 6.5, the diameter of the inner part is 8.5 possibly can see there is uh, a raised ridge at either end that's to stop the the tire working its way off if you don't put those there the tire will just walk its way off uh, within a few seconds of the motor spinning up uh, these are 0 0.2 millimeters wide it's one each side and that um, allows the tire to be properly held in place they're not very tall so make sure they're not tall enough to actually hit the plastic wheel on the uh, the tape itself. So these are around 9.5 millimeters in diameter compared to the 8.5. So they're about half a millimeter tall. We're using uh, 1.5 millimeter wall thickness silicon tubing in this case, um, but it is machined down a bit so it ends up about one millimeter. So it gives us about half a millimeter of spare material by the time we've finished machining it. Might not sound a lot, but it's plenty but it will stop the tyre from uh, working its way off the wheel. And then the centre section is not input, it's not critical, but it's, it's around five millimetres and um, that's what we need to machine the original capstan down to. So um, these are quite easy to make, they only take a few minutes to make, but um, they do work extremely well. So the next thing is we'll go and get this on the uh, lathe. I'm going to use a mini lathe for this, I normally use the a large workshop uh, lathe but for the sake of filming 
it's easier with the mini lathe so we'll go and get this installed and uh, get the machining done we're here at the mini lathe and I've already done the first drive so I already have the uh, spindle adapter I need in place so this is just a piece of tool steel it's actually silver steel that's machined in place so once you machine this you can't really take it out unless you have a very accurate uh, collet chuck as soon as we take this out and move it it will be slightly off center so once you've machined it um, it is kind of sacrificial you throw it away when you take it out and machine another one and it takes a few minutes to machine but I've machined this to be a very close fit on our part so this now goes on here and all we want to do is make sure it's a good sliding fit that's quite a snug fit on there and then we just tighten up the two allen screws doesn't need to be horrendously tight Okay, so the next step is to machine down the capstan, this uh, wider part, so that it matches the inside diameter of our drive wheel. I've decided to use uh, an aluminium wheel in this instance, just for a change. I normally use brass, but uh, for a change I thought I'd uh, try aluminium on this one. And we only need to machine it down as far as the width of this original drive section, not all the way down. But it does need to be quite a tight fit on this. I don't glue it on, it's just a press fit so it needs to be fairly accurately machined. We need to be very careful not to damage the encoder disc while we're doing this so make sure the swarf is moving away from the disc. Now unfortunately I can't do this with the camera in the way, I can't really see the part and I need to machine this quite accurately and I only get one shot at this. If I mess it up um, it's destroyed the driving effect. Uh, so I'll move the camera out of the way, I'll bring you back once I've got this initial machining done and you'll see um, what the next step in the process is. I've machined down the end section of the capstan. It's now approximately one hundredth of a millimetre larger in diameter than the bore in the wheel that will be fitting. So this is now going to be uh, a press fit on here. I can use the tailstock to press this on but what I'll probably do is take this off here and press it on externally. I don't want to push this too hard onto this spindle. Um, firstly it might bend it, it's quite uh, slender, uh, but also um, if it does tend to twist it will press this on off center. So there's only one of the main difficulties or disadvantages with the aluminium wheels is they can gall up when you press them on so you do need to be very careful and make sure that your uh, tolerances are quite close otherwise you'll have a major problem you get it halfway on it'll be twisted and um, it'll never work properly so I'll get this uh, fitted and um, the next step is to machine the outer diameter I've pressed the drive wheel onto the spindle it's uh, quite a nice uh, tight fit on there it's certainly not going to fall off and um, the next thing is we'll spin this up make sure it went on there squarely if it hasn't we'll have to just machine the whole thing off we can't remove it any other way and try again but uh, we'll just spin it up and see how it looks okay looks very good it's gone on there squarely and uh, the final step is just to machine the outer diameter of the silicon tube it's about, with the dimensions of the wheel, it's about 10.9 millimetres in diameter at the moment. It needs to be 10.4 uh, so we can just machine a very slight amount off. Make sure that the um, tube is very well seated before you start this. It does tend to move around when you first put it on, but uh, once it's settled down into the channel formed by the two cheeks on the wheel, it um, does tend to be fairly stable. So I get the tool changed, I'll use a button cutter, these tend to make quite a nice job of uh, finishing the, um, the silicon material and allow us to get it accurately turned to the final size. You need to be very um, careful with this, very small cuts if you try and dig in too far then obviously the silicon uh, rubber tube will just split so be very careful when you're doing this 
um, but we only got about half a millimeter to take off anyway so that should be fairly easy I'll get that done and then this part will be finished that's now machined to the correct size it's 10.4 millimeters in diameter and what we're looking for is this, is this nice even kind of dull matte finish if it's looking shiny or if it's um, kind of breaking up then uh, you're either machining too fast too slow or digging in too far when you're machining this sort of material it's a bit like a grinding process where because you you kind of press the material out of the way as you're trying to machine it um, you'll get the tool so far in then you just keep making multiple passes and it will take off a small amount each time just don't go too far in and then you keep going until you effectively uh, spark out um, as you would with um, a grinding process and you end up with this nice uh, matte finish uh, more importantly when we spin this now what we're looking at here is not the edges but the um, the surface we need to run um, exactly true we don't want it moving around so we'll spin this up and hopefully you can see that the actual surface of the drive wheel is not moving around it's very concentric with the spinning and because we turned this spindle in place and the capstan's a nice tight fit on it um, we can be fairly certain that this is running fairly true okay so back into the workshop and we'll continue with the repair so that's our capstan sorted out it's ready to be refitted just needs a bit of a clean I'm not going to go mad cleaning this, it's very easy to damage the encoder disc, just needs the loose dirt cleaning off. But the next step is to get our mechanism cleaned up. So it's very dirty at the moment, so the next step is to get this and the bracket cleaned up and then we can start reassembling. I've cleaned the mechanism and all the parts. So the next uh, step is to get this reassembled. A reassembly is just a reversal of disassembly. Just need to fit the drive spindle back onto the motor, carefully put the motor back in, refit all the screws, and then we can refit this to the bracket and then refit the bracket to the chassis. So uh, I won't film this, it's just, um, as I say, reversal of the disassembly process. That's the unit reassembled and it spins nice and freely so nothing's binding up and um, it's looking a lot better so the next step is to get the control board sorted out I've already cleaned this and um, all that's left to do on this really done static tests all that's left to do is to refit the processor I've also cleaned up the various parts polished up the door, freed this up so this is now nice and free and uh, I'll get the processor fitted to the board and then we can refit this back onto the main chassis. Fitting the tape drive back into the chassis is fairly easy as long as you get the sequence correct. So firstly make sure the ground lead is uh, already fed through. This can either go between the interface card and the keyboard or between the keyboard frame and the keyboard PCB. I tend to put it through the gap between the interface card and the PC and the uh, keyboard PCB uh, rather than the frame simply because it keeps it out of the way of the keys. Um, but it's up to you whichever you prefer. Next thing we have to do is put in place the door assembly and that fits through the gap. It goes through the gap at the bottom, push it all the way in and then when you lever it down, if it's far enough down that way, it should clip into place. So that's all the way in. Next thing we have to do is attach the eject uh, bar assembly. So that just screws down here. Two screws, one here, one here. So I'll get those put in. once that's screwed in we need to make sure it's free to move and isn't binding on the frame okay so that's uh, nice and free to move so the next thing we have to do is refit the tape drive so that's just held in place with four screws there's two at the uh, top here two at the bottom and uh, that just drops in 
make sure the arms engage properly with the eject lever and um, then put the screws in and we can refit the main board. That's the tape drive mechanism refitted. The next thing we have to do is refit the control board. So that is connected to the tape drive through a ribbon cable, so we'll get that fitted first. The board itself has got this ribbon cable connector that connects to this connector and it's easier to plug that on while the board's actually unscrewed. So if you just get that plugged on first. And then this will just drop down, we can plug this ribbon cable on, tidy up the cables, and then the last step is to refit the screws. Now there are three different lengths of these screws, you need to make sure you get them in the right place. If you put the long ones in the wrong place and try and screw them in, they'll go through the front face of the uh, panel. So uh, be, be careful to get them in the right locations. Um, so there are five screws. There's two at the bottom, two halfway up, one at the top. So I'll get those refitted. So that's the tape drive refitted, all the screws are in, everything's secure. And so in the next video we'll attach this to the machine and see if these drives now actually work. Just flip this over so you can see it from the other side. So as you can see the tape drives, well, at least this drive looks fine. Now we've uh, got a nice free action on the uh, doors, um, so next video we'll plug this in, see what it actually does.